My Granddaughter Drops In by Fiona Dobson, read by Joel Sanderson. I was sitting in my kitchen that morning, minding my own business, as any good cross-dressing trans advertising account executive is wont to do of a Sunday morning. As I looked out into the garden, my eyes fell on the hot tub, which I like to keep full year-round. It struck me that I should probably have Ali, my gardener, clean it up a little. One or two leaves had fallen into it from the beautiful chestnut tree in my garden. The cool blue reflection of the sky on the surface of the water danced with the rusty browns of fall leaves. I felt like I wanted to share the moment with someone. To my great surprise, that was the very moment my granddaughter chose to drop in. This was notable for two reasons. The first, simply put, is that my children have yet to present me with any grandchildren. The second, more dramatically, is that she did quite literally drop in. Judging by the splash zone, I would guess she fell from the sky about 15 feet above the centre of the hot tub. Just as well I kept it full through summer. Naturally, I was a little surprised to see a teenage girl in my hot tub. Not even Auntie Kitty's nephews or nieces would just materialise in mid-air and plummet to the earth like this. I did the sensible thing and poured a little more tea and stepped out into the garden to confront the stranger. Excuse me, dear, I said as I crossed the deck. You seem a little damp. The teenage young woman looked at me and said, Granny? I must admit, I was a little taken aback at that. I adopted a somewhat haughty expression and then said, Do I look like anyone's granny? Well, she said, as she stepped out of the hot tub, jeans and t-shirt soaked. No, not really. Would you like some tea, I said. And then, why don't you come in and I'll get you dried off. Perhaps then you can tell me where you came from. With that, I glanced a little nervously skyward and the girl followed me confidently into the kitchen. This sort of thing doesn't happen often, even in Vancouver. I went to the laundry and found a couple of large beach towels and brought them to the kitchen for her. Why don't you dry yourself off and then you can tell me who you are? Some busy toweling then followed and the loan of a pair of yoga pants and a t-shirt. I handed her the t-shirt and she ran the material between us at fingers. This is real cotton, she murmured. Really? I said. Cotton? That's a hundred percent cashmere and was discounted to a hundred bucks. I said, cotton? I repeated in disgust. She continued to touch the fabric, apparently in fascination. Would you like some tea? An avocado, perhaps? I said, wandering to the fridge. Avocado? I'd love that. Then she paused a little and added, what is that? I stared at her, gathering my thoughts. I began to wonder what I was dealing with. Perhaps you should tell me a little bit about what's going on here, I said as I sliced an avocado in half and placed it on a side plate. I then poured some tea into a cup and placed it in front of my visitor. You're going to need to sit down, Granny, said my visitor. I discreetly reached for the rolling pin I use when I'm baking. I'm really not sure about all this Granny stuff, I said. I think I would have noticed if one of my kids had delivered me a granddaughter. I'm Marina, she said, as though this explained everything. Now, if this is 2022, which I think it is, then you don't know much about me. Let's just say I'm going to make my first appearance in about ten years. I let out of a sigh of relief. Thank goodness, I said. Well, that explains everything, then. I think you're being sarcastic, said my young visitor. What on earth gave you that idea, I murmured. I'm from about 25 years from now, in the future, she said. Oh, I see. I suppose you fell out of one of those flying cars we're supposed to be getting. No, she replied awkwardly. We don't have those. I looked at her, unconvinced. It did cross my mind that this might be one of Auntie Kitty's nieces playing tricks on me. Besides, I can't tell you much about the things about where I'm from. It might screw up the timeline, the temporal prime directive and all that. Oh, yes, I, I think I heard about that Star Trek Voyager, wasn't it? Star what? She responded. That was when I knew she really was from the future. As I poured some chamomile tea into a china teacup, Marina started toweling dry her hair. 
Apparently she'd prefer chamomile to Earl Grey. Let me get you my blow dryer, I said. I brought my hair dryer from the dressing table in my bedroom, and she began playing it over her long, flowing, auburn hair. In a fleeting moment of self-doubt, it occurred to me that her hair was very like my own. Oh, I must check my UPS, she said, as she used the hair dryer. Are you expecting a package? I asked. Marina looked at me a little confused. Then she reached into the pocket of the damp pants which had laid over the back of one of the chairs. Oh, what's that? Is it a cell phone? I said, looking at the small panel of glass she was holding. Phone? Oh yes, Mummy told me about those. We don't use those anymore. I found this a little puzzling, but thought I'd save my questions for a little later, and topped up her tea. This is a universal positioning system, she said. It tells me where and when I am, and a few other things as well, actually. But the important stuff's all here. She showed me the front panel of the device, which prominently displayed the date and a series of numbers which I recognise as the longitude and latitude of Vancouver. It also said, The weather is changeable. I see. Can you make calls on that? Calls? Oh, like at the telephone thing? No, not really. Why would I want to talk to someone who wasn't here? I can send a message if I need to. But it's not really how we do it now, she replied. This is all somewhat confusing, I said. I'm sure it is, she replied. We're not really supposed to go back into the past and meet family members. It's against the rules. I thought about this for a moment. Whose rules? I asked, hoping to elicit a little more information. Well, mostly the rules of common sense, she said. But really, it's just what we all agree to. If you're really from the future, you might as well tell me how you get to a position where everyone agrees to anything. That might be useful. And while you're at it, you can tell me why you fell into my hot tub. That sort of thing doesn't happen every day. Marina looked at me, innocence all over her face. I offered her a piece of whole grain French bread and raspberry jam, which she took with a look of surprise. Real raspberries, she asked. Real raspberries, I confirmed. I'll start with why I fell into the hot tub, she said between mouthfuls. It's really quite simple. I was drifting. In a boat. That doesn't sound very simple, I replied. Why would a boat be... And with this I looked up into the sky. Why would a boat be above my hot tub? It looks like sky up there to me. Oh, you're thinking three-dimensionally. That's something you're going to have to work on, she replied. I looked at her blankly. The sky is up there now, but in 25 years there's going to be water lots of it. Oh, that's ridiculous, I replied. I know sea levels are rising, but we're talking about inches, not feet. Again, you're thinking three-dimensionally. You're thinking in inches today. You won't be thinking in inches for very much longer. But you guys haven't figured out much yet. You don't even know about the permafrost, do you? Um, permafrost? I replied in surprise. It's up north. Yeah, not anymore, it's not, she said, with what can only be described as a look of regret. I stared back at Marina, completely failing to understand her. Well, you're going to learn soon enough anyway. Once the permafrost melts, it releases a lot of carbon. And that's just for starters. It was never factored into the projections, because the people who made those projections just didn't know anything about it. I'm sure there's a lot that people didn't factor into those projections. But a two degrees rise by 2050, even if we miss the targets, I'm sure we'll be fine, I said, thinking to myself that the tomatoes might ripen early in the future. I could probably live with that. Yeah, the permafrost in Canada alone released the equivalent of 50 years of global carbon emissions. As for Siberia, well, let's not go into that. You see, people didn't realise that Kyoto and Paris didn't mean a thing. It was far too little, far too late. This thing was decided when the first steam engine went into production 200 years before the Paris Accord. We learned that in school. Oh, they still have schools. That's encouraging, I commented, trying to rein in my sarcasm. Grandma, you need to know something. A lot has changed. I sat and looked at this visitor, who claimed to be my granddaughter, while putting out some freshly baked bread, cheese, and more jam onto the kitchen table. You know, this is Auntie Kitty's freshly made raspberry jam. She has the best raspberries in her garden. Now, Marina, how do I know any of this is true? I asked, as I spread butter on warm bread. You don't. It's okay, you don't need to, she said calmly. 
I was quite struck by how self-assured this young lady was. A child of millennials, I suppose she would be. That's an interesting attitude, I replied. We do a few things differently now. I don't need to argue with you, you see. You will believe me, or you won't. It's okay either way. I must admit, at this point, I did feel I liked her attitude, confrontational with a hint of condescension thrown in. Perhaps I had once been so annoying. In fact, I knew I'd been precisely as annoying, and precisely as self-assured as a teenager. She continued, You will live your life and choose your path. I'm not responsible for it. I can only share some moments with you and enjoy that. I have no interest in influencing you. And if you hold differing views from me, that's entirely up to you. With that, she smiled engagingly. I felt a growing desire to smack around the head with a baguette. I had to admit that Marina was unlike most teenagers I'd met. Perhaps this future really did include a shifted mindset. How interesting, I replied. Most teenagers today would try to persuade me of their views. You don't seem too worried about the difference. Why would I? she replied. Besides, if you want to hold views that will kill you, it's up to you. I see, I replied, stifling my growing sense of discomfort. Well, with all this climate change worry, I've been thinking about changing vehicles. What advice can you give me about buying an electric car? I can give you the best advice of all. Buy a bicycle. Failing that, learn to swim, came the reply. I have to admit that the thought that this teenager was lecturing me about my psychological position was a little irritating. At the same time, talking with Marina was compelling. What do you mean, views that will kill me? I asked. Well, it's like the people in the South. Some of them had views that were very rigid, she said. Then with downcast eyes, she added, and that didn't go so well. What on earth do you mean? Oh, the wall, that, that, that was Trump. He was an idiot. Marina looked at me. He wasn't the problem, she said very seriously. It was intransigence, the mindset. Well, it's democracy. They don't seem keen on immigrants down there, I replied. I think I read somewhere that there were 200,000 people wanting to cross the border the other day. Seems a lot, but either way, they don't seem to want to have too many immigrants. Kids in cages, lots of bad things happening down there, I said. Yeah, she said in that drawn-out way that all teenagers have which loudly communicates, yes, you're about to learn something very uncomfortable. Marina shifted awkwardly. She then continued very slowly, and as though talking to someone who had a brain injury. Do you know there were 150 million people in Bangladesh living within sight of the Ganges Delta? Now just for a minute think about that. That's one small country. If those people had a problem with 200,000 immigrants. Imagine how they reacted when 20 million refugees showed up. And as I say, that was just one country. Bloody hell, I said, as it dawned on me that there might be something to what Marina was saying. That's the population of Florida. At this, Marina looked even more awkward. Yeah, she said, about Florida. There is no Florida. I gaped at Marina. What do you mean, no Florida? I mean, it doesn't exist. Well, not as you know it. There's a little bit of coast. But it's not really what you would think of as a state. You can't just take away Florida, I said in disbelief. I didn't just take it away. It was going to happen anyway. It wouldn't have made any difference what happened. The water was going to rise, whether they let others in or not. And by the way, that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore. Uh, what sort of thing, I said. The whole barbaric idea of illegal immigration, replied Marina. Oh, good, I said. There's a lot of friction about immigration in some places, you know. Well, not any more, said Marina, a little evasively. What do you mean, I said, smelling a rat. Well... The whole concept of choosing who comes into your land, it's not really a thing now. We can't afford to think like that. I don't really understand, I replied, feeling completely out of my depth. Think of it like this. What are you going to do? Kill them for crossing a border you chose? 
And after you kill the first hundred thousand, what do you do about the next hundred thousand? Kill them too? And the next million? And the next ten million? Really, at some point you decide, wait a minute, we're going to have to do things a little differently. Oh, and don't forget, it wasn't just Bangladesh. As the waters rise, there's no one that's unaffected. I stared at her and said, so what happened? Well, eventually people realized that we had to change the way we thought about a lot of things. Countries and borders were just one of the things. When the number of immigrants that enter a country outnumber the number of original inhabitants, things look a lot different. The concept of nationhood starts to look a lot different. Just ask Australia. What happened in Australia, I asked. After Australia, a country of 18 million, decided to take in 20 million migrants from Southeast Asia, they became the first country to universally reject the concept of nationhood. I mean, think about it. It's pretty meaningless when you have more people from outside than were born there. And migration movements of that size are commonplace now. Australia, like most places, is now a geographic location. It's not a country as such. Funny thing is, it's actually doing better now than ever. Interesting, I said, lost in thought. You mean there's no Canada, no USA, no England? Um, not exactly, but I can't tell you everything. Temporal Prime Directive and all. I found this highly irritating. I was teeming with questions by now. I boiled another kettle and poured the hot water into the teapot. I felt a strange sense of unreality as I added two teaspoons of chamomile tea to the water. But surely, I said, as I waited for the tea to brew, people couldn't just give up ideas of nationhood. It's too much of a leap. Well, they gave up a lot of things, said Marina evasively. That many immigrants would cost a fortune. Where would the money come from for social security? It would bankrupt any nation. Yeah, remember what I said about nationhood? And no, it didn't really cost money, she said, as I refilled her cup. That's ridiculous, I said. Not if you don't use money, it's not. And there it was, as simple as that. Marina carried on. Money's a concept that did serve a purpose. But remember, it's a man-made construct. It's just paper. And if people have no confidence in it, well, it ceases to work. And it doesn't serve us very well today. And it didn't serve you very well when you think about it. Now, we don't buy or sell things anymore. We're still consumers, but we consume much less. We don't buy stuff we don't want. Our technology is our greatest asset, not a piece of metal. We build what we use. We trade from time to time. But why would I want to earn bits of paper to put in a bank? I'm sorry to tell you this, but that idea doesn't serve humans the way it once did. It became more trouble than it was worth for most people, and the few that had a lot of it weren't doing much to help those that didn't. We live very differently now. We do what we're able to, to get along, simply because that's better than all the alternatives. So no, it didn't cost anything. What are you, a bunch of pinko commies? I said. I don't really know what that means, she replied. We're people. We live together and trade. We make and use what we need. And we don't do stuff we don't want to. And don't have stuff that makes the situation unmanageable or unsustainable. So I suppose you don't have luxury cars and gas-guzzling big engines? We don't have any cars, said Marina. Why should I want to sit in a box and go past all the lovely things I have where I live? Some of the farmers have tractors, but other than that, we don't really do cars. That was one of the problems you guys had, I think. You ended up serving the cars instead of the cars serving you. I looked at Marina, trying to absorb all she was telling me. I pinched myself to check that I wasn't dreaming. My granddaughter was telling me that the entire shape of my world was going to change out of all recognition, and that I had no choice in the matter. It seems so hard to believe, I said. I expect that's what people said when they realized the ice sheet was displacing them 30,000 years ago. Still, there's always a choice, isn't there, said Marina helpfully. Well, what are the choices in this case? Or should I say, what will be the choices? Struggling with my tenses. Oh, it was a simple one. Adapt if you can, or drown. It makes for a compelling argument, said Marina, quite matter-of-factly. I see, I said, 
not quite ready to resign myself to this line of thought, and just explain again how you came to fall out of the sky. Oh, I had a little mishap. I was drifting. I got caught in a current. I was swept out into the deep, she replied, apparently unconcerned. That sounds dangerous. Not as long as you have a UPS, came her response. I just jumped when I knew I was nearby your place, and here I am, though I will have to go back shortly. You jumped, I said, repeating her words. What does that mean? Well, to put it simply, I opened up a subspace rift at a position calibrated to drop me onto a known safe spot in my UPS database. It's done by producing a burst of high-frequency Omicron energy at precisely the right place to release me to a predetermined place and time. It didn't take much energy, as you live close to where I do, so it was really just a matter of calculating the temporal drift and... I was looking blank. Marina stared at me with something akin to pity in her eyes, then said, I put it in the machine and it beamed me here. Hang on a moment, you haven't told me about my children, your parents. Or what's going to happen to me, I said. I know, I've already told you far too much, really, said Marina. This is that whole temporal prime directive thingy, isn't it? I said. Yes, but don't worry, you're going to be fine. Just one piece of advice, she said. Yes, I replied, wondering what this presumptuous teenager might have to add. Teach the kids to sail. With that, Marina stood up and picked up her now dry clothes, and self-consciously she pulled them on and thanked me for the tea. She gave me a hug. I guess I'll see you in ten years. And with that, punched a number into the UPS. With a slight hiss and an unexpected smell of seaweed, Marina vanished as swiftly as she'd arrived. I sat at the kitchen table, looking at her empty cup. A moment later, Ali, my gardener, arrived and knocked at the door. Good morning, Mrs. Fiona. How are you this morning? I looked at him, thinking, here was a Syrian refugee from a war, which in a few short years wouldn't matter a jot. It's rather an odd morning, actually, Ali, I said. My granddaughter just dropped in. Oh, how lovely, said Ali, beaming a radiant smile. I had no idea you have a granddaughter. Nor did I, I replied. Ali paused a moment and then smiled and said, Oh, it's going to be one of those days. This has been Jewel Sanderson reading Fiona Dobson's story, My Granddaughter Drops In. You can find more stories at fionadobson.com.